It's terrific. Or excuse me, um, <clears throat> Roxana, if you can record in Spanish on your end, and we will go ahead and get started. All right. Um, one second. Okay. Welcome, everyone. Uh, before we get started, I just want to let you guys know that this session is being simultaneously interpreted into Spanish. To listen to the Spanish presentation at the bottom of your screen in the Zoom toolbar, there is a globe-shaped icon. Click on that icon, select Spanish from the menu. Let's go to the next slide. Oops. I'm seeing a slide here. Okay. Uh, likewise, if you want to view the Spanish slides at the top of your screen, there is a tab labeled View Options. Click on that tab and select Espanol. Right, let's go to the next slide. This presentation has been approved for continuing medical and nursing education. To receive credit, participants should attend at least 80% of the session and submit the post session evaluation. And this is also true if you would like to receive a certificate of successful completion. Next slide, please. And to be in compliance with our accrediting agencies, give me one second. I'll read the disclosure about the financial relationships. We have no relevant financial relationships that relate to this presentation, nor do we have any relevant financial relationships with ineligible companies whose primary business is producing, marketing, selling, reselling, or distributing healthcare products used by or on patients. Next slide. And before I hand it off to my before I hand it off to my colleague Amy Liebman, a reminder that everyone will receive a follow up email with the link to MCN's archived webinars page where you'll be able to download the PDFs of the presentation, watch the recordings, and take the evaluation. And with that, I'm gonna let Amy take it away. Go for it, Amy. Welcome everyone. Um, my name is Amy Liebman. I'm the Chief Program Officer for Workers, Environment, and Climate at Migrant Clinicians Network. And I'm thrilled to have you all here today. Please uh, feel free to put your questions and answers into the chat as we go along. We'll have a time for Q&A at the end, and we'll try to answer some um, in writing as we as we move forward. Um, but right now, it's my great pleasure to introduce two of my favorite colleagues, uh, Jeff Bender and Laz Medeiros. Uh, Jeff Bender, Dr. Jeff Bender is a professor and veterinarian with the University of Minnesota School of Public Health and College of Veterinarian Medicine. Uh, he's also the director of the Upper Midwest Agricultural Safety and Health Center at the University of Minnesota. Uh, he has expertise um, that are unique and lend insight into both emerging health concerns um, with farm animals and the occupational and environmental health needs of the workers who care for those animals. Dr. Laz is the Chief Medical Officer uh, at Migrant Clinicians Network. Uh, he is responsible for the oversight of all of MCN's clinical activities, and he serves as a subject matter expert for various topics in migrant health. Uh, he also is a hospitalist um, in Southeast Pennsylvania, so he's often bringing to our webinars, his, uh, his daily clinical experience um, in uh, Pennsylvania. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Bender and please feel free to uh, put any of your questions into the chat. Well, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So thanks for this opportunity. And the idea here is to really provide an update on the current influenza situation involving dairy cattle and workers. Uh, next slide. Really, the objectives today are, one, to discuss the current state of the H5N1 um, epidemic, um, two, to provide a review of kind of the clinical guidelines uh, for treating and preventing H5N1 and preventing seasonal influenza, and then thirdly, to really identify uh, the cultural contextual or provide those cultural contextual resources and best practices that can be used to address H5N1 and the seasonal influenza uh, in potential farm worker patients. Next slide. 
I just want to emphasize that this is a new situation. Cattle uh, have not traditionally been hosts for influenza and really have not been, really been thought of that. So this really highlights the evolving nature of influenza viruses. And, um, you know, really this detection in March of 2024 really has caught many of us a little bit off, off guard as to, you know, this evolving situation. Next slide. Traditionally, the concern about highly pathogenic avian influenza viruses really has been a concern of wild birds spillover to poultry. And, you know, that is, uh, has, has been ongoing and is continuing to ongoing um, since 2022. Um, over the last couple of years, over a thousand outbreaks have occurred across the country in 48 states um, with well over a hundred million birds that have been affected. So this is a really a dramatic and impactful situation, especially for the poultry industry. Next slide. Now, this situation also is dramatically affecting cattle. You know, since March, we have detected this, this situation, but now um, over 400, actually close to almost 500 confirmed premises across the country, um, dairy operations have been affected in 15 states. So this is a new and evolving situation that's uh, affecting us. And as a result, you know, we have a different workforce that's being affected as well. So not only the poultry industry and the poultry workers, but also now the dairy industry and the dairy workers. Next slide. Um, I think we might have skipped one slide there. Let me see if we can just back up. There we go. Yeah, I just want to highlight this uh, slide. So this is actually since March and to kind of our current situation, you know, that these cases have been bubbling across the country. And then really in the last few weeks really has been a quite dramatic, especially to the California dairy industry, which is really the largest dairy producer or largest producer of milk in the country. So this is actually quite dramatic just to highlight the importance of the surveillance efforts, and our ongoing efforts to really reach um, the workers and those that are directly impacted from this. Next slide. I wanted just to take a few minutes to talk a little bit about this disease in cattle. I know we're focusing in on kind of the worker and the human element, but um, from the limited information that we currently have, you know, this is this disease in cattle is different than what we see in poultry. Often with poultry, um, the the birds die. Um, in this situation, you know, these, these cattle actually go off feed. They decrease the amount of milk that they're producing. They often have kind of more mastitic milk or very thickened milk. Um, they tend to have, you know, GI related issues and lethargy and dehydration and fever. And it doesn't generally cause death in these animals. In fact, very few of these animals actually die, die but a, a, a certain percentage of them are being cold. Now, the information that we have is a little bit limited um, from initial reports. Um, and hopefully with, with uh, you know, additional um, reports that come out, we'll get a clearer picture. The other thing that we want to watch is, is the virus changing in the, in the animal? And is it becoming more severe or, or not? So this is importance for us to kind of monitor that, that report. The other thing that I just want to emphasize is that the, um, the udder. Um, is is where the virus is found and actually is found actually in large quantities. And so really milk and milking is again, one of the greatest risk or potential where the virus is gonna be found. Next slide. So the other thing just to emphasize is that the initial reports from the US Department of Agriculture um, documents how this is being spread. And so um, a lot of this is being spread by animal movements. I mean, a lot of cattle are actually moved uh, and also that there's a, a lot of movement between farms, either with milking trucks or other, you know, feed trucks or other things that are coming on. So those are probably playing a significant role. Also with, within the farm, um, it's because of the concentration of the virus in the milk, really milking and milking machines are likely a, a culprit for what we call within herd spread or how it's being spread with, within the farm. And so again, uh, net, we, we're 
at the infancy of understanding this, but there's a number of ways that are, are this virus is now being spread between farms and within farms. Next slide. Another interesting phenomena is that cats are highly susceptible. And in some of the initial reports, um, basically what we are seeing is that, you know, the cats are not doing well, or they're, they're sick or they're dying. And a number of farms actually have cats on it. They often use it for control of mice. And also, you know, a number of the initial farms that have been affected, uh, a fair percentage of those had sick or dead cats as a result of that some of which were confirmed to have the, the influenza H5N1 virus. Um, also, um, a number of folks uh, also reported that, that they had contact with poultry or chickens. And so it's a uh, potential for, you know, this virus to move between different types of farms. So say between dairy farms to poultry farms. Um, and also with this information, you know, an early recognition, especially for veterinarians, is that if they do see sick cats on the farms that they may consider testing those animals as well. Next slide. Another concern now that we're seeing the spillover into to cattle is spillover into other animals. And so one of the concerns especially is spillover to pigs because pigs actually have receptors to both the avian or the kind of the, what we see in poultry as well as what we might see in humans. And so they have that ability to, in a sense, mix viruses. And so um, there's been a real concern with this. And recently, as of last week, uh, there was detection of um, the H5N1 in uh, an outdoor pet pig, you know, on the West Coast. And so, again, highlighting the um, uh, the importance of awareness that this virus can potentially move, and then also what we call biosecurity of how we prevent infections from coming onto a farm or into a farm, and then also making sure that the workers are aware of this, but also we think about, you know, the workers potentially bringing in influenza as well. Next slide. I don't want to assume that everyone has been on a dairy operation. And so let me discuss just some of the jobs or activities that a worker may have. Next slide. There are a number of tasks on, on a dairy option, dairy operation. And so the worker might be doing a number, a number of things. The obvious one, of course, is you know, they might be milking cows. They might be moving cows. They might be moving cows to the milking parlor. They also might be treating sick cows or cows that might have mastitis or lameness or other things. Um, they're also cleaning out the areas, the alleys, the other areas that, uh, you know, the cows might, might be on. They might be fair, uh, feeding or caring for calves. And oftentimes with calves, you know, they're fed milk, uh, you know, as, as part of, uh, you know, a growing calf might might require. They might be offering a number of machinery or or other things as well, um, getting getting feeds or truck or skid loaders or other tractors that might transport cattle feed. Um, they also might be feeding cattle. So they might have really, you know, in a sense, a number of direct contact areas um, for those for those cattle. Next, next slide. Also, our dairy operations have changed pretty dramatically. Um, you know, now we have robots that might help with milking. Um, we might have rotating parlors. So a cow might go on and then basically rotate around. And then when they're done milking, the, the milking machine drops off and the cows can then remove, like the picture on, the, on my left is showing. Um, also, the other issue is to recognize that the workers are often at the udder level. And so the level of the udder. And so, again, the udder is where most of the virus is going to be found. So they might have direct contact, um, you know, with milk. Elk. They might be getting, you know, peed on or pooped on as well. So there's a number of potential, you know, potential pathogens that might be, uh, you know, that the workers might be exposed to. And so being at that eye level with the with uh, with the udder um, highlights potential the risk, especially if if this is an infected farm and the virus is, is to be there. Next slide. I want to just briefly mention that, um, and, you know, and this is this has been an, an evolving number or changing. So since 2022, here in in the in 
the United States, there have been a number of cases of influenza of you know this zoonotic influenza this this influenza from animals to to people that have been detected um to date we've had 47 cases uh that have been reported uh in the United States uh, since 2022 um 21 of those have been attributed to uh, with poultry and basically you know birds that that have have it and actually need to be you know cleaning out the barns or culling those animals um, being exposed in that situation a number another 25 been exposure to, to dairy um, cattle and usually that's in the form of the milking um, or being in the milking parlor or treating sick animals um, and then there's been one situation in Missouri where there's been no human or documented um, animal exposure. The good news is that there's been no evidence of human to human spread. That's always the concern about pandemics is that, you know, is there evidence now of basically rapid human to human transmission? Dr. Lasso will talk and provide a little bit greater detail regarding some of these exposures and things that we can we can uh, uh, do. Next slide. I want to just highlight that there have been a number of recommendations that have come down um, to provide personal protective equipment uh, for workers, um, and and you know this th this information has evolved or changed as we learn more. One of the challenges, especially in working in a, a, you know a dairy environment, is that they can be hot. It could be, you know, moist, especially if you're working in the the milking parlor, and it could be a steamy environment. So wearing this, you know, these equipment actually, you know, there's a worry about heat stress, especially for these workers. Next slide. To support these workers, we um, at the Migrant Clinicians Network at Marshall, the National Farm Medicine Center, um, and UMASH have been seeking to train workers. And so next slide. One of the areas just to, you know, to remind, especially folks on this call are really well aware of the importance of, especially the Hispanic workforce on dairies. They really account for the majority of the workers um, and they produce most of the milk or are actually responsible for helping produce most of the milk uh, in this country. Um, next slide. Just a little bit of information of what we know about these workers, and I can speak from our experience here in the upper Midwest, is that uh, these workers are mostly uh, coming from Mexico and from Central America, namely Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua. They're as you can imagine, there's a number of vulnerabilities for these workers, you know, concern about their immigration status, clearly language uh, barriers, um, adjusting to, to cultures, you know, uh, here in the upper Midwest, separation from their families. So oftentimes, you know, workers will come up and but leave their family and send money back to their families. Um, housing uh, situation, uh, access and uh, to medical care or, or health insurance, um, the fact that they're doing dangerous jobs or risky jobs. And oftentimes they are not really uh, trained or adequately trained to do these jobs. Next um, uh, slide. So with that, we have um, have trained or developed um, a number of of, of materials, um, modules, uh, and also advocated for a community health worker model of training the trainer, where we introduce that worker to the hazards, how to work around those animals, understanding that animal behavior, also kind of an awareness of the machinery and the equipment that they might be using and some of the hazards that might go with that. Also for them to be aware of the workers' rights and their responsibilities, and also maybe some things that they're not aware of, uh, such as chemicals or confined spaces and the hazards that might go with that. Next slide. What we found through our training, it's really important for these workers to really have kind of um, appropriate materials or, um, and then also really trusted personnel that actually can try to provide that training so that they can relate and also speak in their primary language. Next slide. And I just really want to emphasize that 
on dairies, there are many safety and potential injuries, you know, and so, you know, thinking about prevention challenges is important on, on these farms. Also, we need to consider that changing workforce. You know, this workforce is constantly evolving. We need to be creative in how we engage, educate, and protect um, the worker as well as the producer. And the key that we have found is that, you know, it was relating culturally as well as maybe language appropriate materials um, to really uh, provide that buy-in and trust. Next slide. So um, this outbreak really highlights a number of challenges. And so I just thought I would kind of, you know, these are off, off the top of my head list of things that I've seen as challenges. One is just the, the impact and, and the regulations that go, you know, from an industry standpoint. The other is that we really don't understand the transmission dynamics since this is a new host. Um, it's being shed in the milk. It might be shed for a longer period of time. Also, you know, how do we clean equipment or how do we try to prevent uh, that transmission between animals? The other thing that we're experiencing is the role of the of other animals that might be around the farm. They might be wildlife and other things. And so how do we actually deal with that? Also, do we have the right uh, personal protective equipment and how can we make more uh, you know, user-friendly personal protective equipment to protect the worker? Um, also, how do we do a better job of actually engaging producers and workers and educating them about these uh, potential hazards and risks? Um, we also know that there are, are some other you know, issues that might occur on a farm, like consumption of raw milk. And raw milk might have a lot of virus in it. So how do we discourage that consumption? And then also between states, there's a, there's a number of, of state regulations and they vary. And so it might be really confusing, uh, especially for a worker who might be working across lines or borders that might have different regulations, as well as the producers who might be shipping cattle you know, across those borders as well. Next slide. So in the future, uh, some things that we're trying to do in conjunction with our partners is, you know, try to understand kind of some of the issues, especially for our producers here in the upper mid, uh, Midwest. What are their their perceived risks and how can we best support them? Also, how do we update the current you know, materials that we have um, for outreach and education in conjunction with our um, other partners, uh, namely Extension here in the upper Midwest. And then again, how do we support uh, our producers who are interested in kind of the worker training programs as well? So with that, I'm going to turn the discussion over to Dr. Laszlo. Hey, Dr. Bender, before we head um, to Dr. Laz, I'm just wondering if we have time for one quick question from Melissa. And she said that you mentioned that 15 states have been affected um, have been affected in dairies. And would this number be higher if all states required every farm to test their milk? Yes. Um, you know, so, you know, you know, how does this virus move has been a large question. Has it been largely moving by cattle movement? Um, are there certain cattle, you know, so yeah, providing that um, more broad um, herd testing, uh, you know, would actually help answer and probably alleviate some of the concerns like, gosh, how come we don't have any detection in Wisconsin, uh, you know, which is our second largest dairy state? Um, is that just because they don't have cattle movement there? Uh, so, yes. Yeah, so I think that uh, this is a discussion. I think the other piece of that is the regulatory impact of being identified as a as a a herd that's positive is another issue, um, you know, really for the, from an industry standpoint, um, what does this mean for, you know, producers that don't make a lot of money and, you know, are, are living basically, you know, paycheck to paycheck and what would this do to do to them? And so how do we actually help support that? Thank you. All right, Dr. Laz. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Amy. And thank you, Dr. Bender, for a great uh, summary of all the things that uh, need to be covered in the veterinary world. I appreciate this and it's make my job a little bit easier here. Um, so yeah, we can go to the next slide. So my role here is gonna be to talk about how H5N1 can affect humans and uh, the transmission from animals to humans and how to prevent that. So again, I'm from South Southern Pennsylvania. I'm a family physician 
and I've worked in our hospitals, inpatient and then outpatient as well. I have not yet seen in South Central Pennsylvania any age five N one, but I'm I'm looking at our dairy farms in the area, and also teaching my residents and medical students to be cognizant of the possibilities because we do have dairy workers, we have migrant farm workers here, and certainly we are in a high alert uh, for any possibilities that H five N one will be in our communities in a short time. Okay, so H5N1 in humans. Let's review who are at risk. Next slide. <clears throat> so <clears throat> who are at risk at this time? Uh, dairy producers and workers, workers on poultry farms, slaughterhouse workers, veterinarians, and workers caring for sick animals. Also community health workers who are out on the farms. And also uh, people who take part in farm events and fairs like we do in Pennsylvania. So if you're petting animals and you're in a, in a state fair, uh, please wash your hands and do not touch your face or anything else, any food uh, at that time unless you have washed your hands. Also consumers of raw milk. Now we have had uh, PCR testing of H5N1 viral fragments. Um, we have seen that in pasteurized milk but they are not active virus. So when you have pasteurized milk, you can drink that safely, even with the PCR testing, that is the polymerase chain uh, reaction that amplifies the genetic material that we see in the uh, H5N1 virus, but it does not in the pasteurized milk. If you consume raw milk, however, it is not pasteurized, and so you can have the full effect of the virus. So this is why we are encouraging at this time not to consume raw milk. Um, having talked to my brother-in-law who is a dairyman in central Ohio, and he's part of the Breeders Association there, um, he had suggested also maybe um, the haulers of milk, the truck drivers who haul milk back and forth, uh, they should also uh, be aware of what is happening on each one of these farms as they are in direct contact at times with the milk products in large quantities. Next slide. So you can see a picture here. <clears throat> Again, as, as uh, Dr. Bender mentioned, the farm workers in, in dairy farms are usually at eye level with the udders. And uh, since the virus is mostly in the mammary glands, it's really important for protective uh, reasons to wear some kind of eye shield, preferably something that does not fog easily, but it's really important not to get milk directly sprayed into your eyes, nose, and mouth. There is some in the manure, and it is likely not airborne, but these are the major routes of exposure. And again, you want to protect your hands because if you get contaminated milk on your hands and you touch your eyes, your nose, your mouth, you are at greater risk of getting the uh, virus in your body. And for reasons that are not clear to us yet, the eyes have receptors for H5N1, which is the easiest access at this point for uh, exposure and uh, taking in the H5N1 virus. Next slide. So here we can see different ways that uh, you can have um, the, the cow that's infected, potentially infecting you. So if you touch something contaminated with live virus and then touch your eyes, nose, or mouth, uh, you can get the uh, virus itself. Now, the first picture shows you touching the, uh, the mouth and nares of the cow. And that's not the major way, but that is a potential way to just be cautious if you have bare hands and you touch the nostrils and mouth. Although we know that the uh, raw milk and the udders, as in the second picture, uh, is a more likely source of the infection getting directly into your body. So if a liquid contaminated with live virus splashes in your eyes, like the raw milk from an infected cow, for example, or if you eat, drink, and inhale droplets of contaminated live virus, these are the major ways of getting the virus in your body. So again, protection of the eyes, nose, mouth, and cleaning the hands and being aware of where your hands have been has been the greatest way to prevent the um, mix of uh, virus from cow to human. Next slide. 
So what are the symptoms of H5N1? <clears throat> well, sometimes this can be asymptomatic or very, be very mild. Uh, other times it could have traditional flu-like symptoms such as fever, runny nose, chills, fatigue, joint aches. However, one, one thing that we've seen in those cases where H5N1 spread to humans is uh, red eyes, what looks like conjunctivitis. All of these tend to be temporary. They're usually not uh, so lethal that the patient needs to be in the intensive care unit and maybe not even need to be hospitalized. But clinicians should be aware of these, especially the conjunctivitis. Um, and if you find somebody who is in your community and has been working on a dairy farm, certainly conjunctivitis in that situation should raise your concern and put the uh, H5N1 into your differential. Next slide. So recognizing H5N1. So again, I said, if you, if you recognize where your patient is coming from, what his work environment is, um, this is gonna be very important in your differential. So somebody coming into your clinic that has red eyes, complaining of conjunctivitis and flu-like symptoms, please, please ask for a work history. It's gonna be really important in your differential then to realize that this person, if they work on a dairy farm or they work with animals or somehow involved in the dairy industry, they are part of the at-risk population. And so your heightened awareness will be very helpful at this time and would lead you to do some confirmatory lab testing. Most of the lab testing at this time is with the state departments of health. Now in the emergency room, uh, the ER nurse will test you for viruses, usually one nasal swab that covers about 14 to 15 different viruses. These in general do not at this time include H5N1. They do include influenza A and B, what we know as seasonal influenza. They include COVID, RSV, um, rhinovirus, and several different viruses. So you, you'll be ruled out for many different viruses. <clears throat> so be aware, if you get a negative viral panel with these traditional uh, viruses, the H5N1 is still in the differential. Next slide. <clears throat> so there are new CDC recommendations to prevent H5N1 in workers to reduce spread. What's recommended now, and this is current as of this last month, is testing more workers. So workers who are exposed to sick cows or poultry, but aren't experiencing symptoms should be tested. And again, this is something that we can ask our state health departments to assist us in. If our emergency rooms at this time are not equipped to test H5N1 yet. Also treating exposed workers. We provide Stelomavir, which is Tamiflu, which is something that we used for other influenzas and other viruses in the past. And Tamiflu prophylaxis to asymptomatic workers uh, are recommended, especially those with high risk exposure, especially those who didn't wear adequate PPE. Again, taking a good history, where the person worked, did they use PPE? Did they have any sick cows in the area where they were working on that particular farm? These are all really important questions to ask uh, your patients as you make your differential and try to diagnose, is this just a regular virus or are we looking at something uh, more serious, something highly pathogenic, like the highly pathogenic avian influenza? Next slide. So environment occupational health screening questions for the primary care setting. I try to teach this to my medical students and residents all the time as you encounter patients either in the outpatient setting or in the emergency room, in the hospital, it's always important to get to know your patient better. They can often give you the diagnosis or at least put things higher in the differential than you would have put otherwise. So occupation, describe what you do for work. That's very basic. I think it's really important for us to know what our patients do for work, period. Activities and causes. Are there any physical activities that you do at work or away from work that you feel are harmful to you. Sometimes here we get other exposures to different chemicals and also letting us know that you know sometimes they don't have 
protective equipment because it's too humid or people are cutting corners or anything else that may be pertinent to understanding what your uh, patient is uh, experiencing in their daily activities and if they feel that these are harmful. And then substances, physical hazards, and other causes. Are you exposed to the chemicals, fumes, dust, noise, high heat that you work or away from work? Do you think that these are harmful to you? So these three fairly simple questions are really important for you to get to know your patient, understand the setting that they're working in, and then help you decide you know, where to do next in case you encounter somebody that has potential H5N1 or any other um, dangerous exposures. Next slide. So H5N1, avian flu, things to remember here. Farm workers in dairy and poultry are at high risk of avian flu. We may have to add uh, the pork industry, the pig industry into this now. As Dr. Bender mentioned on the West Coast, we have had at least one case of uh, avian influenza involving pigs. Next question, the general public, you know, are they at risk? Generally, I would say at this point, I do, not, I do not worry about the general public at this time. We have had no human to human uh, transmission of H5N1. Every transmission seems to have been from a cow, a bird to a human, and then it seems to stop there. And therefore at this time, although we have limited H5N1 vaccinations at this time, we are not giving out a vaccine for H5N1. It is not available at your local emergency department or urgy center. And this is something that the CDC is looking into in case in the future, we should have um, further spread of avian flu from person to person. Since we do not have that, we are not giving out H5N1 vaccinations at this time. However, we do have the seasonal flu vaccine and it's available now. And we want people to be vaccinated for the seasonal flu so that there's no opportunity for mixing of viral material. So on a theoretical level now, if you have a farm worker who unfortunately doesn't get seasonal influenza vaccine and catches the seasonal flu, flu A or flu B, usually it's the H1N1 variant, and they're on the farm and they catch the H5N1, there's a potential there, at least theoretically, that the two can reassort and reassortment of viral material. This is what viruses do. They reassort, they mix their genetic material and hope to come out with a winner for the virus, not good for the human beings. So we don't want that opportunity for people to get sick with both seasonal influenza and H5N1 together, because that could cause alterations in the virus itself that could be uh, much more damaging than what we see right now. So again, I don't think that the public is at risk at this time, but I think for healthcare workers, uh, clinicians, community health workers, there should be a higher level of alertness and awareness of what's happening so that in, in case something happens with the person-to-person uh, -person, uh, viral transmission, then we could be ready and be able to identify that. Next slide. So going to the seasonal influenza, influenza A incidence has picked up during the late uh, portion of 2024. I work in the hospital. Last week, we had both influenza A and influenza B. Influenza B usually arrives a little bit later, but it came a little bit earlier in this flu season than usual. So both A and B are there, and there are people now already being hospitalized for influenza in our hospital in South Central Pennsylvania. And also, my colleagues have said, in other parts of the United States. So it is something we can do something about now. So please get your flu vax. The influenza vaccine contains both A and B, and it's now available all across the United States. This is something that we can do right now to prevent the seasonal influenza. And seasonal influenza vaccine can be given with other vaccines, such as the respiratory syncytial virus vaccine, RSV, and COVID-19. You can take all three at one time. And sometimes, as uh, Dr. Bennett mentioned, you know, our farm workers don't have a whole lot of time off from work. And so if they can get the opportunity to go to a federally qualified health center or a clinic to get the vaccine, it's important to note that you can get 
both or all three of the influenza, RSV, and COVID at the same time. Next slide. We go back to prevention. <clears throat> With all the viruses that are around, we're in the middle of, or at least the start of the winter. We're not in the middle of winter yet, but we are already seeing in, in our hospital, people hospitalized for the various other viral infections. And the way we try to prevent the spread of this is going back to basics. Personal protective equipment of hands, face, hand hygiene. Uh, in the case of H5N1, do not drink raw milk at this time. I know people think that it's very healthy and there are certain benefits to it, but at this time, I would not want any of my patients to be drinking raw milk. Again, because pasteurization has taken care of the H5N1 virus, so it is not effective and causing any problems in your, in your body. Uh, however, if you drink raw milk, the potential is definitely there for you to get sick with uh, H5N1. The vaccine <clears throat> at some point could be activated for H5N1 if the CDC deems it a, an endemic or a pandemic, uh, which, as I said, it is not. So I don't want anybody to panic at this time. The public is well protected, but it does depend on the vigilance of health workers, community health workers, uh, physicians, other clinicians to be aware of what's going on across the United States. And I would venture, just as happened here, good communication between clinicians for human beings and clinicians for the veterinary population. So talk with your veterinarian and uh, good communication there between uh, all health providers uh, is really important and know what's going on in your own community. Next slide. So in summary, <clears throat> We are going to have emerging and re-emerging viruses. We see them every year, and I see them in the hospital every uh, winter. And now we have the newer player COVID, and it seems to be coming, uh, but it does not need, need to be necessarily seasonal. We're going to have these viruses coming, and if we can vaccinate against the ones that we know and have vaccines for, this is what I would recommend. You also need to know who is most at risk, and you have to ask your patients, what they do for work. This is gonna be very important for your um, clinical decision-making process. Prevention is still important, hand washing, face masks, um, anything that can protect you from receiving the virus in the first place, not only for you, but your loved ones, your aunt, your grandmother, anybody who's even a compromise. So still, it's very important to be vaccinated and to prevent viruses from getting you sick and getting your loved ones sick to the point that um, any way that you can. And get updates and partner with your local and state health departments, your local veterinarians, and then watch the CDC um, and the uh, information that is provided there. So again, good communication is really important. And um, I think at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Amy. Well, thank you, Dr. Bender and Dr. Laz. That was really informative. And there's a couple of questions and I thought they'd be helpful before I moved into some of the resources, which I'm gonna cover next for us to answer. And the first one, um, Jeff and Laz, I'm happy to help with as well. So the first question is, how likely is it that workers will use protective equipment? Workers find it difficult to wear goggles and other protective equipment provided. Um, and then how are workers going to access vaccines if they do not have access to health care and health insurance? I can take the first, first part of that regarding just the, the um, frequency of which uh, workers are, are using personal protective equipment. Um, you know, on dairies, they are using personal protective equipment, you know, boots. Uh, oftentimes they're wearing gowns just because there's just, it's a wet environment. You know, there's plenty of pee and poop and other things there. So they are wearing some personal protective equipment, um, but they probably need to adjust that. One of the things that, you know, we've learned and actually a recent survey that just came out this past week was 
you know, in the current outbreak, how often are folks wearing personal protective equipment? And and basically some some key pieces are not being worn, such as face shields, you know, protecting against splashing and also, you know, basically masks. Uh, and so those are things that we can continue to emphasize. So that was clearly a deficiency in some of the, you know, the use of the personal protective equipment. For the poultry folks, you know, um, you know, they're especially if an outbreak is occurring, then yes, that personal protective equipment needs to be necessary. The, the situation, especially um, with uh, this, uh, you know, recently in Colorado was basically that it was so hot that people couldn't wear or were not wearing their personal protective equipment correctly. And so that's another issue that highlights, you know, the importance of, you know, providing or dealing with heat stress, providing record or breaks, uh, thinking about hopefully engineering better personal protective equipment so that we can work in those kind of environments. So um, so the bottom line message that was long winded, sorry, is that we do have personal protective equipment, but we're not wearing it probably enough. And so before we move into the vaccine um, piece of that question, I just wanted a quick follow up since we're on the topic of PPE. And that is, um, you know, given the decreased concern about it being airborne, um, is there still a recommendation to be using N95 respirators when doing outreach on dairy farms? And is there any difference if there are no symptomatic animals or humans on the farm? So you want me to try to tackle that one, Amy? Yes, please. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, that that's an excellent question. And actually, I do get this from producers and for those that actually work directly, you know, on the farms, um, is that it's really difficult to actually wear an N95, as we all are willing really well aware of. And it really does impede, you know, our ability to breathe, especially when we're working. Um, and as you can imagine, um, in a dairy environment, say in a milking parlor, it's very moist and wet. So it's very possible that that N95 is going to be not working, um, you know, because it's going to get moist and wet. So, you know, it really does depend on the work environment, the work situation. And so if you look at the CDC guidelines, they've actually been modified a little bit to actually reflect, you know, the work environment, thinking about the work environment, what's going to work best. And so this is where um, we need to come alongside our producers and say, this is probably the best thing, you know, you don't have evidence of this this virus, this is what, what you may want to do. You may want to consider a facial. We want to make sure that things are not getting splashed in people's faces. You know, pee and poop can have pathogens as well. Um, we may consider, you know, uh, you know, a surgical mask versus an N95 respirator, just because that, that's what's, you know, going to be required. However, it does change when we do have evidence that the virus is on the farm. And so, um, one of the things that we're seeing is that we're identifying those um, higher risk, you know, activities such as if they're treating a sick cow, if they are working in the milking parlor, if they are exposed to to milk, then they're going to need to take those extra precautions. And so that's going to be the general recommendation. Great, uh, Dr. Ben. I was just going to say that for the for my veterinary colleagues, I would recommend since they're going in usually because they're seeing a sick animal, I would venture to say, yeah. Just take that, just burn one N N95 mask for your own health. But I completely agree with you. I, I worked on my brother-in-law's uh, dairy farm and we had we had these eyeglasses and we had these like fog sprays that you use for like scuba diving masks and all that to try to keep the fog out. So I, I know that people are already using some of that. They wear nitrile gloves even before H5N1 to prevent mastitis going from you know cow to cow. So, so there are, you're absolutely right. There already are some protective equipment that, that they are using, but the damp area there, you know, it, it just doesn't make sense to have anything paper that would last for a long time. But if you're a community health worker who comes in to, to do something or a veterinarian who comes in for a short time to look at sick animals, I would, you know, I would hope that they, they could get an N95 during that short time and knowing that it's going to get, you know, used up and just throw it away at the end of that. So I want to protect my veterinary colleagues as they go into sea sick animals. And, and, and Dr. Laz, just on the community health worker piece of it, we are recommending that um, if there is um, a positive 
herd on the farm, we're recommending that our community health workers actually don't go to that farm um, to make sure that they're protected. Um, but uh, let's get back to the vaccine question. Um, and if you need help with this one, I'm happy to help. How are workers going to access vaccines if they do not have access to health care and health insurance? Well, in terms of the vaccine availability, again, we, we have the vaccines for all these other viruses. And so it's make sure that you already have those basic viruses for which we do have available vaccines right now. As far as, far as H5N1, um, I think the CDC has the capability to augment the production of that should we see uh, cases going from human to human. Yeah. Um, I don't know the financial, Amy, you're yeah. more an expert on the finances of that. Right. So the CDC has really been emphasizing, just as you did in this presentation, the importance of getting your seasonal flu shot. So they have provided extra seasonal flu shots to states where we have those positive herds. And they're working really closely with community organizations, um, the National Center for Farm Worker Health and other groups to try to come up with ways to make sure that our um, our uh, farm workers are getting vaccinated um, at no cost for for the seasonal flu. So that's a really important um, intervention. Um, the next the next question, and then after that, I'll, I'll stop for a moment and go into the resources because I want to make sure everyone has resources and then we'll have a few more questions. And any questions that we don't get to, we will be sure to follow up after this webinar um, and answer them. But this is a really good question for a nurse in the city of Laredo. Thank you, Cassandra, for asking this. Um, she works in the city of Laredo Health Department in the Immunization Park Department. We have not seen any reported cases in our area as of now, but I was wondering if we need to be equipped with the test for H5N1 flu, or if there's a certain criteria to need to have this at hand. And if so, where can we get this equipment and supplies? And um, we I should appreciate um, some help with this. So I would say if you're, I don't know the state health departments of every state and what what they what they have available at this time. But if your state health department, the one that's local closest to you, uh, communicate with them to see if they do have access to vaccinations. But what they can have access to is the testing equipment. So some state health departments, especially now, I think um, Amy, you showed the uh, we discussed Colorado, for example. I think that was one of the places where now that there's a larger number of obvious dairy cow um, H5N1 infections. And so I think I think state health departments where there's already proven cases are revving up more. But I can't speak yeah. to all the different it's, departments. It's, really, it's really important for all the local state departments to be in contact with their state departments of health. Um, and understand what that's what that landscape looks like in in their in their state. And so um, I would recommend if you're in Laredo, starting off with the state um, Department of Health. Um, I'm gonna uh, unless Jeff, you had anything to add to that. I'm gonna pause for just a second so that we can go over a few resources, and then we have a, some really good commentary going on in the chat that I hope we have a few minutes to return to. So if you could please go to the next slide. So we have a number of resources and a number of places where you can get those resources. The MCN website, the UMASH website, the CDC, and the National Center for uh, Farm Worker Health. They all have some really great tools to be able to uh, help you um, understand what to do, have some resources in terms of the education that you can help talk to your um, uh, community about, and there, there was a question in there about given the vulnerabilities, the, the real fear that our immigrant uh, workers have, how are we gonna get some of these CDC recommendations to them? And that's where you all come in. I think the power of the community health worker, whether at community health fairs, whether you're able to go onto farms, but talking to workers about the importance of getting vaccinated. Um, you are their trusted messengers. And you're also the eyes and ears for veterinarians and uh, community health centers and health departments because you understand what's happening in the community. So I really 
want to make sure that you realize how important you all are in this equation for looking at H5N1. And then hopefully some of these resources uh, will be able to uh, help you as you approach farm workers in the community. Next slide, please. Uh, we have um, a, a specific web page on the MCN site devoted to uh, the bird flu. Please take advantage of that. Um, the next slide, please. Here are some more resources, some fact sheets. Next slide. Um, here's the information to connect with UMASH. Uh, I work with MCM, but I'm also the Associate Director of UMASH and we have a ton of resources for you there. Uh, next slide, please. This is for um, connecting with MCN. Again, MCN's your home for uh, so many resources, not just on H5N1, but on uh, from diabetes to pesticides, you'll find the information that you need. Uh, next slide. Uh, we hope that you take a moment to visit um, the great nonprofit site and leave some nice remarks for MCN. We could really use your help um, to get to our highest level of a, of a nonprofit rate rating. Next slide, please. And it's been a week. Um, we invite you to come to our webinar uh, on Thursday, where we'll talk about post-election advocacy and activism for clinicians serving immigrant and migrant patients. Please join us for that. Um, next slide, please. And um, this is our evaluation. Um, we encourage all of you to fill out the evaluation. Esther is going to put the evaluation link in the chat um, as we um, finish up here. Uh, but we really would like for all of you to do this. It really helps us. And then if you want continuing nursing education or continuing med medical education, you have to fill out the evaluation. Okay, um, as you're working on the evaluation, we have just a couple more questions that I would like to go over. Um, and um, here is a question about some of our dairy farm workers in Michigan are also indigenous. What type of outreach is being done for indigenous workers? Um, do you want me to field that one? Yeah, um, go ahead, Amy. Yeah, go ahead, Amy. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think that um, we need to work on providing education and content in the language that folks understand. And so there are resources available if you're trying to reach indigenous populations where we can at least get some of the um, resources uh, in a verbal format. Um, and uh, I know the National Center for Farm Worker Health has some of those resources on their website. Let's see other questions here. Oh, um, I'll give this one to you guys. Uh, I'll give this one to Dr. Jeff. Um, thanking you for the amazing info, but are there any potential policy changes or requirements that mandate farmers to make sure workers are trained and with PPE um, and with PPA instead of limiting it to recommendations? Um, a good question. I think that uh, this highlights, you know, as we look at pandemic and pandemic response, um, and especially, you know, right after coming after COVID, um, you know, we're dealing with a number, you know, as, as Dr. Lazo pointed out, we're dealing with a number of different viruses, you know, it, if it's not MPOX or, you know, uh, Zika virus and other things. So I think that what this does is it gives us an opportunity to actually look at this. And actually the worker is becoming much more prominent in our discussions when we talk about emerging diseases. So yes, I think that that's actually part of the discussion that we need to move forward, make sure that it's on the, the, the uh, table, you know, as we think about, you know, preparing for the next pandemic. And I thought, Amy, I think it's important to emphasize that we have in, in MCN that, you know, the workers that we're working with here, they are essential workers. They've been essential workers during COVID. They were essential workers in other situations. You know, they provide us with our food supply. And so it's really important to do as much as possible. And that's part of what we do in MCN is advocacy to make sure that policies in our states and, you know, 
national government are addressing those those kind of issues and those needs. So, and Amy does a wonderful job. She she spearheads a lot of this for us at MCN. But this is an important fact of what, what we need to be doing for our essential workers. Um, and we're here. We're talking about the dairy industry, but we also have again poultry and everything else that we that we have. That um, I have a lot of pickers of fruit here in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, and uh, it's important to protect all of them uh, when these virals viruses present and um, they are most vulnerable because they're always at the front line. So yeah, it is really important that we emphasize that our essential workers need the protection and we advocate for that. Right. Well, as we always say, uh, worker health and safety is public health. Um, so they need to be the uh, central to some of the work that we do. Dr. Bender, any, any last comments from you as we close? No, it's been a real pleasure. Okay. Thank you to our interpreters, um, to all the wizards behind the curtain at MCN who made this presentation great. And thank you, Dr. Bender and Dr. Medeiros for a fabulous uh, contribution to our knowledge on this topic. Thank you so much. Great. I really thank quickly just want to add, uh, keep an eye out on your inbox. You'll all be receiving an email from me later today with the links to our website where you can download the PDF copies of the presentations in both languages. You can also take the evaluation and watch the recordings. It'll be coming to your inbox later today. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Laz. Thank you, Dr. Bender. Thank you, Amy. Thank you to everyone at MCN. Thank you to our interpreters. I hope everyone has a great day. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.